right, so, yeah, all right, everybody can hear me. Wonderful. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. This is an amazing space to be speaking in, and I'm, I'm really grateful that uh, I, I got to come and speak with y'all today. Um, so, I need to turn this on. I think I need to kind of keep my head this way, don't I? Is that, is that what's going on? Is that better? Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, Michelle's done such an, like, a great uh, job at introducing me. Uh, just some quick things about me. Uh, my name is Emily. I do two restoration. Um, I also do, um, well, this, these are some examples of my projects. Um, so St. Louis number one. Michelle knows I'm a cat lady because I burnt out my laser pointer on my cats. So, <laughs> this is, and I'm not kidding, I actually did do that. Um, <laughs> this is the same thing with Cemetery Number One, this is Lafayette Cemetery Number One. Um, I, I work for families, uh, for the most part. So people come to me, they have a, a, a tomb that they, their family is buried in, um, they want to be able to care for it, uh, and I help them do that. But working in, in the masonry aspect of the, the, the projects is really the very last thing that I do. Um, I combine historic archives, architectural history, understanding that, this is going to work, new, that that's a lake brick uh, versus a, uh, a river brick. Being able to understand the construction of a tomb um, and, and being able to tell people really what the history of their tomb is um, really improves not only the preservation itself, um, but also the family's relationship with the tomb and with their family buried there. So um, I do a lot of stuff that isn't, isn't directly uh, <laughs> just working outside, although I do work outside. Um, so a lot, of, um, a lot of my research has to do with historic landscapes, understanding that our cemeteries are changing all the time. It's really easy for us to uh, walk through any cemetery and see them as like outdoor museums when they're really anything but. They change so much. Um, and a lot of them do get lost. So um, tonight I'm going to speak about the cemeteries of New Orleans that have been lost. There are at least eight. There's actually more than what I'm going to be talking about, but these are kind of the big ones. Um, and uh, between eight, the 1800 and 1957, um, We've lost these cemeteries to changing landscapes, changing urban demographics, um, and then also the uh, industrialization of the funeral industry really uh, makes a big difference. This is Gerard Street Cemetery, by the way. Yeah. It's a beautiful cemetery. Um, so our first cemetery, the first cemetery that we ever had is gone, is lost. Um, this is, uh, the St. Peter Street Cemetery was established um, at St. Peter and Burgundy, um, sorry, St. Peter Street between Rampart and Burgundy, um, in 1723, so just five years after <laughs> the city was founded. Um, and it's important to understand that the cemetery, the St. Peter Street Cemetery, would not have looked anything like, say, St. Louis Cemetery Number 1, um, simply because no cemeteries looked like St. Louis Number 1 in 1723. We just didn't understand cemeteries or death that way. Um, colonial people, administrators, priests, politically powerful people during that time would have been buried under the floor of the church. Um, this was a, another way that we understood death at the time, that if you were important, you were buried under the floor of the church, um, so you were, that way you would be in the prime spot for the resurrection, right? Um, and there are about 300 people buried underneath St. Louis Cathedral. Um, but like I said, so even though we wouldn't recognize what St. Peter Street Cemetery looked like in 1723, the French colonists absolutely would have. Uh, because their cemeteries look this way. This is the Cemetery of the Holy Innocents in Paris. This is a, a painting, I think it was under 18... I guess it was a drawing that was made from something else in 1850. Um, but the Cemetery of the Holy Innocents was uh, a landscape that reflected the way burial was understood in the 18th century, which meant burials were made in the ground with very little money. <laughs> the idea of individuality and death didn't really exist. The entire purpose of a um, really the only thing that, that significance that was placed in the body of the deceased was that it was a really good reminder for everybody else that they were going to die. Um, it was this understanding of momentum mori. Um, and so the, the St. Peter's, I'm sorry, the uh, Cemetery of the Holy Innocents was used for burial for almost 800 years. It was not a large space. When burial space needed to be uh, reused, remains were pulled up and put in, in ossuaries, charnel houses. Uh, anybody who's traveled in, in Paris would, you know, maybe have seen the uh, catacombs. This is actually, well, I'm gonna, 
Uh, <laughs> uh, this space that's behind here is, is one section of the catacombs. Um, so this has this kind of this change from the charnel houses, the memento mori. This was the, the statue that was at the entrance of the cemetery of the Holy Innocents. It's not a cherub. It's not you know the idea of you know the life eternal. It was somebody who was reminding everybody else, you are mortal. Um, and this sort of changes in the mid 18th century with the Enlightenment. Uh, where we get these new ideas of humanism, ideas of public health. Uh, this is also where we get the ideas of miasma, like the bad air causing disease, which we blame on cemeteries, which survived for a very long time. Um, urban planning, the way we memorialize people uh, was changing, and it really didn't suit um, what the Cemetery of the Holy Innocents was, which was a bit very austere, uh, and, and this guy. And um, also issues of, uh, of capacity and sanitation were happening when we were talking about urbanization. Um, so all of the remains of the Holy Innocent Cemetery were removed, placed in the uh, Paris um, catacombs. And uh, we, it, it, that, that happened in, um, I think, yeah, 1780. Um, and uh, then in, in 1805, we have Pierre Lachaise, right? We have this huge departure. So over back in New Orleans, um, we have, uh, in 1788, there was, there was sort of this discussion that there was a fire, a flood, and an epidemic, and that's what overflowed the St. Peter Street Cemetery. And that's, that's absolutely part of it. Um, however, uh, and this is why the St. Peter Street Cemetery closed um, in 1788. Um, that absolutely could be true, um, but it also has to do with the fact that the, the French extracted people in Louisiana knew what was changing in Paris. Like, there was no longer a place for this urban cemetery. We were going to have this new cemetery that was outside the city walls. And that was St. Louis Cemetery Number no. 1. Um, St. Louis Cemetery Number no. 1 was opened in 1789. Um, it really didn't become what we know it to be until the 1830s when we got more people coming over from France with pictures of Père Lachaise. Um, and, and designs to create the tombs as we know them today. Um, St. Louis Cemetery Number no. 1 itself um, used to be significantly larger. Um, it's been pared down over the years by the streets around it. Um, so it, it, in one regard, St. Louis Cemetery Number no. 1 has actually been significantly uh, lost. Um, unlike the Cemetery of the Holy Innocents, though, the people who were buried in the St. Peter Street Cemetery were not moved. Um, in the 1820s, the property had been uh, divided, parceled out, and sold and developed into houses. Um, and this is actually part of the, the parcel document for that, uh, where it shows like who bought what parts of uh, L'Antique Cemetery. <laughs> um, but it wasn't lost forever. In 1972, 1984, and 2011, different construction projects would disturb the cemetery on Rampart Street. Um, this is something I wasn't immediately aware of. In 1972, uh, the, the remains were sent to the coroner's office, but were lost. What, what was excavated uh, was lost. Um, 1984, um, <laughs> the disturbance of the remains due to construction was not reported until months into the project, um, which was really unfortunate. In 2011, the property owner wanted to build a pool um, and contacted the state, and the section of the cemetery was excavated. Um, in this situation, the 2011 and 1984 remains were reinterred in St. Louis Cemetery Number no. One in 2015 in a ceremony. Um, Cypress Grove Cemetery Number no. Two. So it's kind of fun to jump from St. Louis Number no. One and, and the French Quarter over to Cypress Grove um, because we have this really big <laughs> difference in culture, right? We have the, the the French Creoles down in downtown, and then we have a cemetery like Cypress Grove, which was very much an American cemetery. Um, for anybody who's from um, the Northeast, if anybody's familiar with um, uh, Mount Auburn. Um, yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, Mount Auburn, I think it's also in Boston. Yes. Um, anyway, the Cypress Grove Gate, um, as you guys are all used to seeing at, Cyper, uh, at City Park and Canal Street, um, is almost an exact copy of Mount Auburn Cemetery's gates. Like, they were, the, the folks who were establishing this cemetery were Northerners, they were Americans, and they wanted their cemetery to be a garden cemetery like Mount Auburn. Um, and Cypress Grove itself was. Cypress Grove had a sister across the way named Cypress Grove Number no. 2, um, and it was not. It was developed as a potter's field uh, starting in 1840. Um, so I don't know. Um, laser pointer, but. So we have Canal Street right here, um, and this is Canal Street Boulevard. Right here is where Cypress Grove Cemetery Number no. 2 used to be. Um, 
So uh, the cemetery was used as a potter's field um, until about like through the 1860s. Um, a lot of Civil War dead, both Union and Confederate, were buried there. Um, in 1883, the Fireman's Charitable Benevolent Association, which owns Cypress Grove um, and, and Greenwood, um, posted a notice in their newspaper saying, well, if you have family buried in Cypress Grove number two, you need to remove them. Um, and then there's kind of not any no mention of it ever again. And eventually it just goes away from maps. Um, and we have instead Canal Boulevard. Um, and it was, from what I understand, used as sort of like a trash dump. Um, however, again, the cemetery was not lost for long. In 1985, construction crews accidentally unearthed almost the entirety of the cemetery. Um, the remains were uh, examined by UNLV. The cemetery was almost, entire, like, uh, almost entirely exposed in 1985. Uh, those remains were removed by UNO archaeologists and brought to the Faces Lab. Um, and in 2015, I'm sure a lot of you folks who live over in Metairie area, especially if you live in Lakeview, probably remember uh, that the streetcar, uh, the canal streetcar finally got the turnaround that RTA has been wanting, or RTS has been wanting since the 1960s. They incidentally almost demolished Oddfellow's Rest for that turnaround in the 1960s. So like this has been long desired um, on Canal Boulevard. Uh, in order to make that streetcar turnaround, they had to determine um, <laughs> how, how to do so without disturbing the approximately 20,000 remains that were um, beneath Canal Boulevard, uh, and uh, that permission was granted, and now we have our streetcar turnarounds. Uh, I, from what I understand, there were some remains that were removed, but most were left undisturbed. Moving on to Locust Grove Cemetery, number one and two. Um, to show y'all that this map, um, if anybody, are, all right, so if you can read, we have Ferret Street um, between Toledano um, and Sixth Street. So this is in Central City neighborhood over near LaSalle. Um, this green space that you see is in the middle of the Harmony Oaks housing projects, um, and that used to be a cemetery. That used to be Locust Grove Cemetery Number One and Two. Locust Grove Cemetery Number One was established in 1859. Um, Locust Grove Number Two was was designated in 1877 and wasn't around for very long. Uh, there were a lot of complaints about the the cemetery that it was a nuisance. It was filled. Um, and it was closed after the yellow fever epidemic of 1878. Holt Cemetery replaced it um, as the potter's field of, this, of the city until 1967. Um, our potter's field is now in New Orleans East. Um, in 1905, Locust Grove Cemetery number one and two were demolished to make, well, I mean, demolished by meaning like maybe they removed some headstones, um, but uh, to make way for the Tommy LaFon School. The Tommy LaFon School uh, was rebuilt in 1954. I'm, I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with this modern <laughs> building. Um, after Katrina, um, there was a lot of attempts to repair the school, um, and there, there was a lot of kind of hemming and hawing about whether or not it was, was salvageable, and then all of a sudden there was this discovery that was on top of two cemeteries, as if that was not pretty well, well known. Um, but uh, in, in this instance, Louisiana law was interpreted as necessitating the demolition of the, the school. Um, in 2011, it's now an empty fenced in lot. Um, Bayou St. John Cemetery um, was established in 1835. So this is one cemetery that I cannot tell you where it is. Uh, as far as I know, there isn't anybody who can. Um, the cemetery sort of acted as a potter's field. It was segregated by religion and uh, free and slave status. Um, it appears, it doesn't appear to have been closed up. There wasn't like some notice where people were like, oh, why you St. John Cemetery was, is, is a nuisance, we must close it. It just seems as if it was stopped being used. It just went out of use. Um, it's often confused as being somehow absorbed into St. Louis Cemetery number three, which is on Esplanade. Um, it's probably pretty unlikely. It's a lot more likely that it's near the Car Carondelet Canal. Um, but. Uh, I, uh, I try to ask as many archaeologists as I can, whenever I can, if anybody has any new ideas of where Bayou St. John Cemetery is, and nobody does. Um, there was a time that somebody thought it was a park, but they did some uh, excavation and determined and ruled that out. Um, Gates of Mercy Cemetery. Um, our first Jewish cemetery doesn't exist anymore. It was demolished. Um, so our first congregation, our first synagogue in New Orleans was a congregation Shara Hesed, uh, or Gates of Mercy. It was founded in 1822 when a visitor from uh, New York, I think I wrote New Orleans, a visitor from New York, Jacob de Silva Salas, was shocked that he could not buy matzo on Passover. And so he started a new congregation. That was our first congregation. Um, this is the building of um, Gates of Mercy. Uh, it was on Rampart Street uh, until it was demolished 
Um, this is it, I think, in the 20s when it was, a, uh, I think, a laundry. Uh, it was a laundry um, for a while. Um, in 1956, um, so the, the, the sort of the history of our congregations, our Jewish congregations, is sort of that they, there's sort of this march as they move farther uptown um, over time. And Gates of Mercy does the same. Um, Gates of Mercy is, is uptown now. Well, Gates of Mercy is, is now um, Toro. But uh, the cemetery itself was demolished in uh, 1956. It was on Saratoga and Jackson Avenue um, in uh, Central City. It was sold to Goodwill Industries, and I, I believe it's a, a playground now. Um, the remains that were in that cemetery were removed to Hebrew Rest Cemetery in Gentilly. Uh, the Olivier de Verger Cemetery is, is a, it, for, for anybody who's a historian in the, in, in the room, like this is a fascinating thing to research. There's still a lot of research to be done on the Olivier de Verger Cemetery. Um, the, the, the family cemetery of the Olivier and, and de Verger families in Algiers was at the corner of Verret and Pelican Avenue, which is now uh, known as Confetti Park. In 1916, the cemetery that has been used, it's had been used since about 1808, um, was removed and moved to Battery Cemetery when the family donated the land as, as a park for the children of Algiers. This is the tomb. Um, I'm extremely fond of this tomb. It is, I've been researching for 10 years, and I, from, in my educated opinion, there is no tomb that is as intact as the Olivier de Verger tomb um, that is as old. It is the oldest most, it's the oldest tomb in New Orleans that is still, you could look at it and understand what it looked like in 1808. Um, and it's precious. And it's also made out of granite, so that's one reason why it's so, um, it's held up so well. Um, the burial documents for that tomb are housed at the historic New Orleans collection. Um, about 129 burials in the Grand Tombeau um, were made between 1820 and 1977. However, in that document, there's also several burials that are marked with just a little cross. Um, that seems to suggest that these burials were made outside of the tomb. Uh, they were mostly enslaved people um, and some infants. So it's unclear whether those remains were removed with the tomb. Um, and uh, until I can get a hold of anything that shows documentation of that, um, it's really anybody's guess whether or not they are in the tomb itself or they are still in that park in Algiers. And of course, there's Gerard Street Cemetery. Um, <coughs> So Gerard Street Cemetery was founded in 1822. It was a, a, the first Protestant cemetery. It was very distinct architecturally from the Catholic cemeteries. Um, as you guys saw the, the photo um, on my second slide, they loved obelisks. And this is something I love about Protestants. They just love obelisks. They're just up everywhere. The, uh, um, the Protestant cemeteries in, um, all along the Gulf Coast are the same way, just all these beautiful obelisks. Um, so uh, Gerard Street Cemetery was located at um, in the central business, what became the central business district. Um, and it was a, a collection of tragic mass graves. It was the site of a lot of epidemic burials, as well as really beautiful high architecture. Um, however, it was in a very inconvenient place. Um, and in the 1960s, well, 1950s, um, it really was in a very inconvenient place for uh, sort of this new urban center under the, uh, under the administration of Shep Morrison. Um, the cemetery had had its problems, uh, absolutely. Since the 1930s, the owners of the, the cemetery, Christ Church Cathedral, have been really struggling to save it. You see a lot of newspaper articles where they say, you know, please come reclaim your tombs. Um, there's a lot of, in pretty much every situation like this, there's a lot of unclear understanding of who's responsible uh, or who has even any right to save the cemetery. Um, and also, um, you know, Shep Morrison wanted to extend Liberty Street through it. Uh, so by the 1950s, um, there was actually sort of this tragic thing that happened also where Christchurch is like struggling and then all of a sudden a whole bunch of city trucks come and start demolishing the walls. And there's, a, there's an open outcry from Christchurch and the official response from Shep Morrison is, I was under the impression there would be no objection. So, and then after that, they're like, well now we have to demolish it, look at the wall. And uh, there's sort of like this really tragic sort of demolition by neglect. Um, so this is Gerard Street Cemetery in 1957 when it was deconsecrated. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, so 1956, uh, the cemetery was finally appropriated by eminent domain. Um, if anybody's curious about its location, it's not underneath the Superdome necessarily. It's more like the parking lots by the post office. Um, and uh, the remains of white descent were moved to uh, Hope Mausoleum on Canal, uh, Canal Street. Uh, African-American remains were moved to Providence Park Cemetery, which is up on Airline. 
Um, this is one, just one example of what was lost with Gerard Street. This is the new Lusitano's tomb. Um, the photograph on the left is what it looked like when it was built in the uh, 1830s, and the photograph um, in, on, the, uh, sorry, on the right is what it looked like when it was built. On the left is what it looked like right before it was demolished. Um, to be frank, I've seen a lot of photographs of what uh, Gerard Street Cemetery looked like in, in 1957, and um, I mean, we have, it, it could have been saved. Um, it's, it's really tragic what could have what could have been. Um, there were a lot of really heroic people who tried to save pieces of the cemetery when it was demolished. Um, the Colonel William Bliss tomb was moved to Fort Bliss in, in Texas. Um, this tomb on the right, right here, that's uh, Angelica Monsanto Dow. Uh, she was one of the first Jewish New Orleanians before she converted uh, to, to uh, I think she was Lutheran. Um, but that's her tomb with the skull and crossbones. That went to the Louisiana State Museum. Uh, there's all those beautiful obelisks. Um, and uh, yeah, it was really, really a tragic thing what happened to Gerard Street Cemetery. Um, and I have a couple like just little lanyards here for uh, uh, just a, a lots of other stuff that we lose, just to, just to help kind of really point out just how much I think what why I'm so fascinated by this is because it makes you really realize what in the cemeteries like just what that one tomb that survived has has had to survive. Um, just how precious those survivors are. The tomb on the left here is the Jesuit tomb. It was in St. Louis Cemetery Number no. 1. Um, it was demolished in the 1930s. Um, incidentally, it was in the Protestant section, which is kind of fun. Um, the tomb on the right, it was in uh, Metairie Cemetery. In the 1950s, it was knocked down and then kind of built around to make it look kind of ultra-modern, and now it's called the Excelsior Mo Mausoleum. Um, and this is St. Rock Cemetery number two in, um, I think, 1910. Yeah, around 1910. Um, and we, we also misunderstand just like how many cemeteries were originally below ground, how many really lovely wooden monuments we used to have, um, and just how they, I mean, uh, St. Rock was like that, Holt Cemetery, Carrollton Cemetery, uh, we really have, and, and there's always like one specific guy who was building them. Um, the St. Rock Cemetery ones are like, you see a lot more of these little crosses with the heart on them. And you gotta figure there was like one guy who did that. Um, and so, you guys ready for the today view? Um, so, I mean, just the entire cemetery has been built over. Uh, and so, you know, we just we just lose so much. Um, I just want to do that again because this one is just wild to me. Yep. Um, so, it's. Things are so much, I mean, I guess this is the whole reason for me to be, even be talking about this is, is to drive home the point that like, what we see is so precious. You know, what, what we do see in the cemeteries is like the very, very precious survivor, maybe 10% of what's made it through. Um, and it's, it's really worth valuing and, um, you know, bringing your grandkids to see it <laughs> um, and, and really enjoying uh, the landscapes as they are and, and, and understanding them for what they are. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna close up at. Although I do wanna point this out. This is one of the, these are photos from, um, uh, Gerard Street Cemetery is being um, deconsecrated. Um, this was taken by uh, Life magazine um, in 1957. And there's a, a bunch of photos where there's this little boy running around the aisles. And this is when he trips over a casket and his dad has to help him up. Um, and it's a, it's, a really, it's a really intense photo. Anyway, um, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up and I would be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Please wait until I come with the mic. I'll hurry. <laughs> I thought the oldest Jewish cemeteries are Bernadotte and uh, Canal Street. You're talking about Dispersed of Judah. Dispersed of Judah was established in 1856. Uh, Gates of Mercy was the 1820s. Actually, and I think um, Gates of Prayer on St. Joseph Street, which is over by, I think it's Langenstein's. I always get the wrong grocery store, so I'm so sorry if it's not the right grocery store. But, uh, but I think that one is actually a little bit older than Dispersed to Judah as well, but like by two years. Have you been down to the St. Bernard Cemetery? I have not. I, I know it's actually really near here, um, but I have not. I, I've worked in Shelmet uh, Cemetery, but not in. in you, are you the one redoing Delaron? Delaron's probably not. The bricks and all. 
No. No, okay. I'm not familiar. I was just curious. <laughs> but you need to come down to a cemetery. I think it's from, what, 1767 to 87? I, I mean, I love, uh, I, I have like a whole list of upriver and downriver cemeteries that I need to visit because uh, St. James Cemetery, St. Charles Borromeo, somebody was mentioning. Um, like really for anybody who wants to understand what New Orleans cemeteries looked like before about like 1830, <laughs> Um, it's really the upriver and downriver cemeteries that have some of that stuff, like the table tomb, stuff signed by Prosper Boy, like stuff that predates 1830. Because honestly, in New Orleans, we, we got rid of it. We made something new, you know? Um, so I, you're right, I need to make it over there. Anyone else? I don't know. Uh, I was curious, curious the, uh, the first picture that you showed when we came in, what cemetery was that? That's also Gerard Street. Um, this, so um, I run a blog, it's just oakandlaurel.com slash blog, um, and I posted links to all these photos, this photo, um, all of these photos. These were all taken by um, a Life Magazine photographer in 1957 of Gerard Street Cemetery but they were listed as Gerard Street Cemetery, and I'm pretty sure that's why they haven't been published in anything. Um, but if you, uh, um, on, on my website, I link to all of them, and it's, it's, it's I mean, it's pretty striking. Um, it's a, I'm pretty sure this is the day that the, the Christchurch priests, priests came and officially deconsecrated the cemetery. In the very early days of the colonies, like you talk about the 1730s, 1740s, were there any cemeteries that were built outside of the immediate area of the French Quarter, which Barrack Street, and on the other side, which was a dump for the trash you know, in the old days, were there any cemeteries that were established in those days immediately outside the French Quarter? Well, for, Which for, was the first one, maybe, uh, you could tell me about? Well, St. St. Peter Street Cemetery was our first cemetery. Like, so that was in within the bounds of it. Well, technically it wasn't at the time, but the, the one that I spoke about, that was the first cemetery. Um, but, I mean, I, uh, like Michelle said, I, I went to school in, in Charleston, and, uh, the, you know, Char in, in Charleston there's sort of like this joke where, you know, like, in old Charleston, like, any place can be a cemetery. Um, and we find that up a lot when we do with projects. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I think it's very possible that there were family cemeteries. I think there were very pos it was very possible that, uh, like in the case with St. Louis Cemetery Number no. 1, post-1789, um, there's evidence of burials that, that happened right outside the cemetery walls. Uh, Gerard Street, same thing. So, um, I don't think that there were, I mean, I don't know of any official cemeteries that were first, but like, but there probably are. <laughs> um, is, yeah, I mean, probably with no markers though. St. Peter Street Cemetery didn't, um, as far as like the archeologists who excavated there, like I asked if there were any markers, there really weren't. Um, that doesn't really happen until 1789. So is St. Louis Cathedral the oldest cemetery in the city? I mean, it, technically along with St. Peter. Um, yeah, uh, although I, um, I tried to get underneath there uh, once, and <laughs> um, the thing about <laughs> The St. Louis Cathedral is that it's because uh, when before it was St. Louis, Louis Cathedral in the 1850s, it was St. Louis Church, and the footprint was much smaller. Um, and the area of the original footprint was filled in the 1960s with cement as some way to like shore up the foundation. So any evidence of those burials, which from what I understand is probably about 300, um, is pretty much gone, with the exception of people who were like priests that were buried in the 1930s and stuff are sort of up front. Um, so yeah, there's there's no way. Trust me, because I want to know pre 1789 stonework like more than anything. Um, unfortunately, there is no evidence. There's nothing left. Yeah, great job. Uh, I'm you. just curious about Saint Vincent de Paul. Which one? Uh, all three. Oh, okay. So the the, the one on Saint uh, on Louisa Street. Okay, because there's a, there's technically another St. Vincent de Paul on Sonyat Street, like up by Isidore Newman School, that is totally unrelated. Yeah. So you're talking about the the, the St. Vincent. Uh huh. Yeah, St. Vincent de Paul is, is my favorite cemetery. I hate to say it because like that makes me sound like I don't like the other cemeteries, but I love St. Vincent de Paul. 
fault. I wrote a, a, a blog post on that. Um, it's called Yu Yuya's Louisa Street Legacy. Um, so if you're interested in reading it. Um, but uh, Stevenson Hall is amazing. Um, if anybody has family buried there, I encourage you to visit. It's it's a beautiful cemetery, um, and it's I, in part it's as beautiful as it is because it's been ignored. So like nobody made big terrible preservation mistakes in the past in it. Um, it was it was founded in. Um, People say 1840, I think it's a little bit earlier. We don't really have, um, there's not really good records for Stevenson de Paul because it was always privately owned. It was founded by a Spanish man named Pepe Uya, Don Pepe, um, Jose, Don Jose Pepe Uya, who was famous for two things, uh, owning a cemetery and being a duelist. And he also did duels in the cemetery. Um, but, a beautiful story, but the thing about St. Vincent de Paul too is that just the diversity of language there. Like, there's a tablet there that's in Corsican. You know, there's there's uh, Corsican, so uh, like uh, the island of Corsica above. Sorry, yeah. Um, there's a tablet in Corsican. The, the the diversity of stone cutting there is amazing. So there's there'll be an Italian um, stone that's carved by a French cutter, or a German stone that's carved by an Italian cutter. There was a guy named Americo Marazzi. If you ever look at the bottom corners of some of the ta uh, tombs. He was this like guy who built a ton of the tombs there, and then he just disappears and goes off to Vicksburg, and like I don't, I can't find him. <laughs> but it just uh, the United Brethren, the Sons of Louisiana, the, the what is left in Saint Vincent de Paul is at risk, um, and it is absolutely precious. Uh, it's just a fantastic cemetery. So yeah, everybody go visit Saint Vincent de Paul and be really respectful and enjoy it for what it is. Yeah, most of well, most of my relatives, which they moved down here or lived in the other night floor. We're all buried in St. Vincent de Paul. And when when people in the Blackwater moved out of St. Vincent, moved out of that area, both the, a lot of them moved into St. Bernard. Mm -hmm. So when I've done all my genealogy research, uh, all my friends, all my family, all go back to that cemetery. So it's very it's ingrained in this area right here. But we were speaking about that before before the lecture, actually. I think it also has to do with the fact that like St. Vincent de Paul seems to be very accessible from 610 like, or, or from around. Because people, I know people feel some discomfort about going to the cemetery. I would encourage people to not feel this, that discomfort. Um, in the time that I have worked in that cemetery, I've seen more family visit. Um, and also the guy who takes care of that cemetery is like awesome. His name is Tyrone. He lives around the corner. Um, and he is just the most kind, helpful person. So everybody visit St. Vincent de Paul. <laughs> Anyone else? So St. Vincent de Paul originally belonged to the, the Yuya family, later on the Suarez brothers who married Yuya's daughters. Um, sometime in around, around 1905-ish, um, the Stewart family obtained it. I don't know how they did. I haven't been able to find the transfer of documents. When the Stewart family, which also owned Metairie Cemetery and Mount Olivet, when they sold out to Service Corporation International in 2014, um, that the, those cemeteries went along with it. So technically, right now, uh, St. Vincent de Paul belongs to SCI, also known as Dignity Memorial. All right, ladies and gentlemen, one more. Thanks. Oh, wait. <laughs> Where is the oldest uh, Masonic uh, grave? Oh, like in Masonic Cemetery? I'm actually not sure. I very rarely do work because they in that cemetery because they um, they really have their stuff under control. Like uh, it, the guy who manages that cemetery, I can't remember what his name is, but like they're very present there. Um, what Masonic Cemetery was founded in the 1850s, so it would probably be around the 1850s. It was. It's in Metairie Cemetery now. And so were there any others like in Algiers that have been lost or is that No. There's um McDonoughville, St. Mary, St. Bartholomew's, there's several other um, cemeteries that were uh, racially segregated that are still there. Everything is still there with the exception of the Olivier de Berger Family Cemetery. And possibly part of the Olivier de Berger Family Cemetery is still there. All right, Ms. Ford, you have done a, an awesome job. Thank you very much. I'm going to avoid